So this is a video that talks about um, the significant terms algorithm and sampling and uh, the way it's used in the graph technology that we have. Uh, and what I wanted to do was to illustrate exactly the sort of signals that we're looking for. Um, so what I have here is a, um, a really a sort of test framework that I have for doing various things with Elasticsearch that helps me visualize um, and develop algorithms and so on. So um, what I wanted to show you was the uh, wisdom of crowds type example. Where we're looking at last FM data. And I've got a number of different queries to show you uh, the effects of sampling and significant terms and so on. So let's start with um, a completely random selection of people. So we're going to run a query here and uh, we're using a script just to get a random, completely random 10% sample of all the people in the data. Um, and then we're gonna go looking for what's special about them and what's significant about them. Um, and actually there's nothing significant about these people because they're completely selected at random, but we'll see what the effects are. Um, so if I run a search for, uh, a random selection of people. Oops, sorry, let me just get the right index. Let's run that again. So we're gonna get a completely random selection of people here. And each person is a uh, Elasticsearch document. So a person, gender, age, and then this list of artists that they happen to like. Um, and you can see that this person likes uh, Radiohead. Um, and that's not at all surprising because that's um, actually the most popular artist in, in the whole data set. So, um, here's another person here, and I really wouldn't be surprised if he likes Radiohead. Coldplay is another super common, super connected item. So yeah, this guy likes Radiohead too, so not particularly surprising. Um, now what we can do um, using the significant terms algorithm is, is try and identify if there's any anything that's significant about this collection of people. Now, I have a visualization here that helps me plot this stuff. So. What we have on the x-axis is the percentage of all listeners who happen to like a band. In this case, we've got Coldplay here. So Coldplay are enjoyed, if that's a strong, too strong a word perhaps, for, by 65,000 people out of the 355,000 people in, in, in the data. So it's, it's quite a long way up this, this scale of, of listeners. Not everybody likes all bands, but you know, Coldplay are one of the most popular ones amongst everybody. And sure enough, in our random sample of listeners, which was 10% of the data, um, the percentage of people who like Coldplay is broadly the same. And in fact, all of these dots on this line represent each of the individual bands. I'm just gonna zoom in here so you can actually see them. And what's interesting is that in a random sample, um, bands like Coldplay are liked in exactly equal amounts in the random sample um, as they are in the general population. Um, and as we go down the sort of the scale of uh, popularity, the Arctic Monkeys, the Cure, they're kind of lurking around so the sort of mid range of popularity in the general background and also in the mid range of popularity in the random sample that we took. Um, and down towards the obscure end, we have bands like the Libertines or Misfits. Um, they are, again, liked in equal measure by the random sample and the background. And to be honest, it would be surprising if these dots appeared anywhere else other than directly on this line. Um, it would suggest that our sample wasn't quite as random as, as we'd hoped. So this is what significant terms is all about. It's about for a sample of um, your documents, the ones that match your query, we're looking for things that have moved away from this line here. So we'll open a query where we've got a very targeted query. I'm going to search for the people who like just Mozart. There's no ambiguity about this. Um, we're going to find all the people who like the artist Mozart and then find out what's significant about their tastes. And if we run that query, um, you can see, not surprisingly again, there's uh, people here who like uh, Mozart and various other classical artists. And again, Radiohead makes, a, makes an appearance. So I'm, I'm not entirely surprised by that. So let's have a look at what significant terms pulled out from, from these users. It's not a random sample, it's the Mozart listeners. And you'll notice that what it's focused in on, um, our y-axis is now Mozart listeners, not random people, is that it's picked out some dots that have made a massive movement. So Bach um, is enjoyed by 99 of the uh, Mozart listeners, 99 out of 
uh, sorry, 1,500 listeners liked uh, Bach out of the 3,888 uh, Mozart listeners. So almost half of them said that they liked Bach. Now that's surprising because um, it's about 1% of all listeners who, who like Bach, and yet here it is, leapt up the rankings to 50%, perhaps, of all the Mozart listeners nearly. Radiohead is, is still popular with the Mozart listeners. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. Um, but it hasn't actually moved up away from its positioning here um, on the y-axis. It's probably, if anything, might have dipped down a little bit. Um, but that's not significantly connected to Mozart listeners. What is significantly connected are all these things that have made big movements. So we've got Bach, Beethoven, Vivaldi, Chopin, Handel. These are all big movers. Um, and we can see that they've actually moved some way up the rankings in our sample, in our sample of Mozart listeners. So that's all good. That's, that's exactly what we're looking for. This signal, these things moving up and away from that line the line of expectation. Now the problem is that not all queries are as good as my last one. My, my last one was very, very clear and un, unambiguous. It was looking for one artist, which was Mozart. Now, what if we were actually using a slightly fuzzier query? So let's say we were looking for people who had a mix of artists. So we can talk about the dilution of significance here. So our query is now find me people who like Mozart or Bach or Coldplay. So these might be the last three artists that somebody listened to. And what tends to happen is if we use aggregations in significant terms and we look at all of the results that match our query, then we're going to pretty much match half the data. Um, so Coldplay is a very popular band. So that is going to dilute any signal that might be attached to Mozart and Bach uh, listeners because we're going to get people who just like Coldplay and not Mozart or Bach. So we're going to match an awful lot more people now just because we had Coldplay in, in our list. It's the Coldplay effect. So uh, our first result might contain a mix of Mozart and Bach. So we've got Bach here, and he probably likes Coldplay, this guy. He likes Mozart too, um, and he likes Coldplay. So that's why he's number one in our search results. He's a high-quality match. But as we go further down the list, we start to run into people who just like Coldplay, for example. And let's have a look at the effects of what they do to our, our signal. So if you remember when we were looking at just Mozart, um, the dots we were looking at hugged this line very, very closely. They were very close to this uh, y-axis here because they were kind of rarer choices that had moved significantly up the rankings. Um, what we've done by adding Coldplay into the mix is started to bend these dots over towards this horizontal, sorry, this uh, 45 degree line here. And consequently, the band suggestions start to become a little bit more mainstream and a little bit more boring. So Radiohead, uh, The Beatles, News, The Killers, Chili Peppers, U2, sort of kind of bland, sort of mainstreamish sort of bands. So we've just diluted whatever classical signal we had in the data with some kind of mainstream stuff that unites everybody. So this is the problem if you look at all of the data that matches your query and you have a fuzzy query. You just tend to bend these dots over towards the, uh, the line of grayness and you know everything, all the colors mixed together. Um, it almost becomes like a random sample. So the solution to solving that problem is not to look at all the data, just look at the high quality matches, the people who have most of the things that you were looking for. So the answer is quite simple. Um, if we use um, a sampling aggregation, um, we can tune out the effects of uh, the Coldplay uh, mixing in with the classical stuff. So we're gonna run exactly the same query. The only thing we're gonna do is slightly, slightly different is we're going to focus the significant terms aggregation on a sample of, let's say, the top 2,000 um, listeners. So the ones who have most of the things that we were looking for, and not just you know, the long tail of people who happen to like Coldplay. Um, and if you run that query, two things. One, it runs an awful lot faster than if you look at absolutely everybody, all the Coldplay fans. And two, um, we keep our dots nice and um, high and away from this 45 degree line 
and we've still got Beethoven and Vivaldi and Handel and Tchaikovsky and all these sorts of things. So some questions um, that came up, which were, what is a good sample size? Now, generally, it doesn't really matter too much. If I, if I change this down to, let's say, a 1,000, I don't get radically different results, to be honest. I still find um, that we get Beethoven and all the other various different artists, Vivaldi, so on. Um, if you start to lower it too much, if we take it down to, let's say, 100, um, then that's not a great sample size. It's like conducting a survey, but only bothering to ask you know, a handful of people. Um, the signals don't really come through um, as effectively. So it, it's quicker to run. You're looking at less stuff, um, but the actual uh, quality of the results tends to go down. In fact, we've actually not achieved our target of finding um, artists that are referenced by more than, we insist on at least three people by default, um, ha having an interest in a particular artist. And we haven't found in our selection of 100 um, listeners, people who happen to have three things in, in common. So we can relax that constraint. We can say, all right, well, normally we insist that an artist is found in at least three different documents. And we can up the size of, oh, sorry, decrease the size of this down to, let's say, one. Um, so that will, will get us some results, but I don't think they're going to be terribly good ones because you know, we've got, for example, this chap, Richard Dyer Bennett. Uh, we didn't expect to find many of those in our sample, but we actually got one. So that's seen as significant. Um, it's not terribly significant, to be honest. Um, there's a lot of things that only ever occur once. Um, that's what's called the long tail of uh, listens, perhaps, or activity. So generally what we do is, is we run with these defaults where we have um, a minimum dot count of three just because two perhaps is, is, again, something that doesn't have a lot of reinforcement. But if three different people say that you know, they like band X, then we start to believe that we've got enough evidence to actually suggest that. So the defaults are three. Um, in the graph API, we use a number of 2,000, but it really depends on... Uh, your data um, and your queries as to what would be a good sample size. Um, some documents are bigger than others, so if you're looking at banking transactions, they're very small, so you might have you know, a very large number here. If you were looking at um, Wikipedia articles, um, they're very large and contain lots of terms that we would need to kind of do background frequency checks on, so perhaps wouldn't have it quite so large. Um, but it, it doesn't really... Um, matter too much what you set as the sizes here. If the signal to be found in the data, uh, we can draw it out. Um, and it's really just a case of experimenting and, and just setting some settings. It's not something that I generally uh, play with um, an awful lot. Um, other than the fact that if you're actually doing forensics work, then you know, every single document is interesting. Um, you only need to have one document that says, bad guy X is the director of company Y, for that to be an interesting uh, company name to pull into, uh, into your graphs or your, your data results. So in those sort of situations, we're looking for a, every document count. So we set minimum document count down to one. Um, but for, for wisdom of crowds type stuff, um, then what you generally want is to have a few people asserting that something is, uh, is connected. It's a bit like waiting for a two or three of your friends to actually say, yeah, I think this movie, this new movie that's come out is good, rather than relying on the, uh, um, the, the evidence of just one, one assertion only. So hopefully that gives you uh, some insight into what it is that we're looking for in the data when we are, are using sampling. Um, I think the other thing to point out as well is um, we also have diversity settings. So uh, an important part of sampling is that um, you don't get skewed by one uh, particular source of data. So if there's a tweet that's doing the rounds and it's being retweeted quite heavily, then one of the things you might choose to do in your sampling is to say, um, let's have a diversified sample and have no more than 100 tweets from any one country or author or you know whatever choice of field you want to throw in there. We have the options for the, um, using diversification to make sure that you get a healthy mix of uh, things in your sample. 
Okay, that's it. And uh, hopefully you found this useful.